normally Pastor Mike, I'd be saying welcome to midweek with Pastor Mike right now, but yes, <laughs> but this is earlier than midweek. It is. This is a yeah. this is a special thing that um, we're really grateful that you agreed um, to do with us and and for us because you know as we've been talking and studying through Romans chapter nine to eleven. We, there's just no way in the hour that we have each week together to go through all of the nuances or ask, answer all of the questions um, that come up from these pretty incredible things that Paul's teaching yeah. us here. So thank you for, for being here okay. and for being here with all of us together. Be nice to me, please. <laughs> Do you want to pray, Pastor Mike, and I'll sure. just start firing? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Lord, thank you for our time together to study your word and to grow and to probe the mysteries, Father, that are beyond our comprehension at times. You're God, we're not. You're infinite, we're not. We're finite. And so your word speaks to things, Lord, that are way beyond our comprehension. But that's okay. Even though we don't understand everything, we're going to trust you. We're going to take your word because we believe every single word of it is inspired by God. And so, Father, we trust in you we ask for help, we ask for understanding, we ask for your blessing. And today especially, Lord, I want to lift before you Jerry Bonifield as he mm -hmm. is in the hospital, really hurting, going through a lot of pain. As he's battling cancer, Lord, we don't know how long or what the outcome will be, but we give it all things to you. So be with Jerry today and surely, and bless them. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I just uh, got a chance to uh, visit uh, Shirley and Jerry at the mm -hmm. hospital this morning. And um, this is just a side note. Um, so what, what topic do I talk about and I read more than probably more than I should and use as illustrations more than I should? Uh, Taco Bell? No. <laughs> I don't know. World War II. Oh, World War II. Okay. Yeah. So I prayed with Jerry, the guy in the bed next to him. His hat was there. Mm. He was over 100 years old. He's a World War II vet. Mm. And so I sat there and shared the gospel with him. Wow, that's really neat. And so I just want you to know that all appointments are divine appointments. Hey. All right. Okay. Well, with that in mind and with the doctrines of sovereignty and election, and um, really this big word that we've been striving to understand, which is foreknowledge, mm -hmm. um, on our minds after having come through these few chapters, we have eight questions that all relate in some way to, uh, that have all kind of stemmed from, from this particular uh, teaching and these particular doctrines. And the first one, I think, is really interesting. So obviously this person has foreknowledge in mind because she asks, when God created Adam and Eve, did he know they would eat the forbidden fruit? Mm. Well, I would say that depends if you're super lapsarianism <laughs> or you hold to infolapsarianism. That's the answer. No. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously, uh, I believe that God being God, knowing all things from the beginning to the end, knew that they would partake in the fall. The, the question often comes then, so when the election, the topic we've been discussing, mm -hmm. did God choose us in him in Christ before the fall? And that is what we call superlapsarianism. Okay. Believe it or not, that's just a big word, a uh, theological word, don't worry about it, um, that they believe that God made that decision before man and woman ever fell in the garden. Some believe that God made the decision to choose who he's going to choose after the fall. And so uh, that is called infralapsarianism. Mm -hmm. And those two camps argue about the timing of it. But when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter because it happened in the mind of God years ago and we're just not given enough information. So I don't want to make something out of something that's not something. Sure. So, but we will say that I do believe that God, in his infinite wisdom and understanding, was not shocked. He was not surprised. When the fall happened, he did not say, oh, no, shoot, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. I've got to figure this out, you know. No, it was, I believe it was God's preordained plan. And for that plan, it was to bring greater glory to himself mm -hmm. by rescuing the fallen man and the woman from sin covering them 
of course, with animal skins as a pre-picture, a precursor of what was to come, the ultimate death of Messiah. Yeah, and I think that that's really the, one of the things that's helpful for me in, that I think is maybe, um, I don't know, insightful in answering this question is that John, when he is referring to Christ in Revelation 13, uh, specifically Revelation 13:8. He refers to him as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Mm -hmm. And so if Christ is slain from the foundation of the world, and we're considering this question, when God created, created Adam and Eve, did he know they would eat the forbidden fruit? That we see in the mind and the counsel and the plan of God that Christ was already slain from even before that foundation um, of the world. And right. so I can't imagine that I mean, we know that that, that that plan, just what you're saying, is going to yeah, bring glory to Yeah, and it ha also has to do with time. God mm -hmm. sees everything in a, you know, we're bound by time. He's not. He's timeless. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's hard to, for us to even wrap our mind around, right? I look at that and I go, Phew, man, how do you, you see it all. But essentially, would you agree that we could say that before Adam and Eve sinned, the provision for their sin was already secure? Yeah, that's what Christ. I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure, okay. yeah. Okay, so question number two um, is different, and it is specifically in regard to a word that you used in one of our podcast episodes um, where you talked about Arminianism. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is Arminianism, and how does it relate to Romans chapter 9? You have that, que <laughs> you have that question? Okay. <laughs> Mine has spelled out here Arminianism. Oh, okay. So Arminianism is the people who have good food. Mm -hmm. Ar Arminianism is a guy by the name of Jacobs Arminius, who his theology is named after. He was a professor, a teacher, uh, he's Dutch, and uh, he taught for a while at the University of Leiden in the, we call him a Nihalander or a, from the Netherlands, and uh, he was born after John Calvin and was educated by people who believed in the doctrines of grace. Mm -hmm. Well, he could not reconcile that in his mind, so he came up with counterpoints to the doctrines of grace, mm. and thus changing the theology of how, I think, the scriptures spell out that we're going to be saved. Okay. He would basically say, you are a free moral agent. You have the ability to choose. God does not elect you, but you, of your own free will, choose God. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch more to it, but that's essentially the basis of what he was saying. The problem with what he was saying is that he was saying that people have a free moral will. Mm -hmm. The only people who ever had a free moral will were Adam and Eve. They were in the garden. They had done nothing right or wrong. They had the total freedom to choose to eat of the fruit or not to eat of the fruit. The Bible tells us in Romans 5.12 that death entered into the world, death by sin, mm -hmm. so all men have sinned. And, of course, all men not only have sinned, but we come short of the glory of God, which means my will that I have to choose and make decisions, I still have a will, but it's not free. It's bound over by my sin. So I make choices based on, without Christ in my life, I make choices based on what I want from my will that has already been tainted by sin. And so in order for God to change the will, he has to come and do what is called the process of regeneration. He has to quicken your dead heart and make it alive. It's how God works. And because he does that, we then can respond to him. Mm -hmm. So it almost feels like at times when I say this or talk about it, some of us kind of sit back and wonder and say, that's just so confusing, I don't understand it because I decided to follow Christ. And the answer is, is of course you did. Of course you did. You responded in faith. You responded in pen repentance. You responded in a belief. No one is saying that you didn't. We're just saying that God came along and enabled your will to be able to respond to it. And so when we talk about free will, you're not necessarily saying 
people don't have the ability to choose one thing over the other, you're saying that our will is not free from sin because we are under sin, that only God's will is completely free because he is absolutely free from all imperfection and impurity. And so he has complete freedom to act outside of sin where everything, that, that doctrine that we've been studying of total depravity, meaning that, that while not everything we do is totally as, as bad as it possibly could be, everything we do is touched by sin because we are under sin in this world. Yeah, so, yeah. so is that what I you don't mean? necessarily like the term total depravity. Mm -hmm. I use the term total inability. Sure. So if you were a Roman Catholic, you would say this. You would say that God goes to the hospital bed, you're on the hospital bed, you're in really bad shape, you're dying, and God takes this medicine and he holds it to your lips and you slowly drink it and you become healed. And so you cooperate in a synergistic way with God to save you. Mm -hmm. And that's why they talk often about good works and salvation being together. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that you're not on a hospital bed sick. The Bible says you're dead in your trespasses and sins. So if sin killed you, if sin made you spiritually dead, you remember what God said to Adam and Eve in the garden. He said, the day you shall eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. Well, physically they didn't die, but physically the uh, start of the process of dying, mm -hmm. spiritually they were dead. Right. And so if we're born dead sinners without Christ, then that's where God has to come and quicken you. And, you know, um, maybe an illustration might be you're dead, you're laying on the table, and God comes with those paddles and, <laughs> and you come back to life. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the guy I was talking to today at the hospital was telling me, <laughs> about his near-death experience where he saw the bright light and everything and he yeah. was stepping away and then all of a sudden, boom, you know. So ultimately, our will is not self-determining because we can't save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. That's what we mean by total inability. Right. I'm not totally depraved in the sense of I'm just as bad as Hitler or more w wicked than him. It's not a measuring stick. It's my, I don't have any ability to save myself. Right. But though I may not have the ability, don't think that God doesn't say to me, you have to respond in faith, you must have to respond in trust, you have to respond in, in truth. So all of those things, election is the one thing at the top if we made a list mm -hmm. that God does. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, he gives us what we call an effectual calling. That's number two on the list. Mm -hmm. Number three is regeneration. Those three things you don't have anything to do with. It is until the fourth thing where we respond in what we call conversion, and that is faith and repentance, mm -hmm. faith and trusting in Him. Mm -hmm. you, you have to respond to the gospel. Right. And so the Bible doesn't say your lack of response to the gospel suddenly means um, that you have a free will. Your lack of response to the gospel, the Bible says, is your own fault. Right. Not because God didn't choose you, but because of human responsibility. So when people don't respond to the gospel, they, they can't stand before God and say, uh, you know, you didn't choose me, so I couldn't respond. Mm -hmm. God said, no, you heard the message. You heard the gospel. You chose not to respond. Right. So the way the Bible presents it is not, I'm not saved because you didn't elect me. The Bible says you're saved all to the glory and the grace of God, and you're unsaved because of your own stubborn heart. Mm -hmm. God is willing that all men should come to him, which is the free offer of the gospel. Mm -hmm. But if you reject it, that's on you. Yeah, I think it was Alistair Begg that said, in the plans and purposes of God, we are not pawns regarding his sovereign power. We're not pawns, but participants. Yes, we are. And so then we are while our salvation is where the Lord receives all of the credit and um, for our acceptance of the gospel, that those who reject the gospel are responsible for that rejection, that God is not responsible for their rejection of the gospel. That's right. He is responsible right. for our ability to receive it. Right, and he's really clear on that. Paul is in Romans chapter 9. Mm -hmm. And then in other places where Jesus, you know, just go to the book of John or any of the, the gospels where they reject Jesus and he stands, Matthew 23, he stands before Jerusalem weeping and he says, you know, I, would you have come to me, I, ga I gather you like a hen gathers her chicks to herself, I would have you come to me, but you would not. 
There it is, mm -hmm. rejection of the gospel. So before we talk about that and the sort of doctrine of reprobation, could you give a, a one-sentence summary of Arminianism and a, maybe a one-sentence summary of Calvinism? Could you do that? Okay, so Calvinism was done by a man named, by the name of John Calvin who didn't sit down and write out a system of five points. <laughs> we call them the five points of Calvinism. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So that's what Calvin taught, but he didn't outline those five points. He that didn't was, come up with the tulip? No, he did oh, not. Huh. That came later on uh, from those who study his writings. But the person who wrote more about that than John Calvin was Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther's theology got tweaked by the guy who followed him named Philip Melanchthon who took a lot of his writings and reworked Lutheranism and I'm sure Martin Luther is rolling over in his grave not Martin Luther King but Martin Luther the reformer in the 1500s so now Arminianism not Armenian Arminianism mm -hmm. basically takes every one of those points and goes counter to it okay and I I would like to say that Though we might sum up five points of what it is to be Arminian and what it is to be a Calvinist, they're not basically five points. There's a thousand points. Sure. There is a thousand points. It's not just these five areas. It's that we disagree in virtually how they present God as not being sovereign over all things and how they present man as being determining his own will mm -hmm. and man doing what he wants to do and that he cooperates, not only cooperates, but initiates his own salvation. That man is self-determining. Yeah. So in Arminianism, yeah. man is self-determining. Very much so, mm -hmm. yeah. So if you want more information, you can just Google the five points of Arminianism. Sure. And they'll give you the five points. And then there's even on the web uh, comparative charts that you can download that are just what this guy believes, what this guy believes, and how they compare. And you can, you can look at that stuff. But our best understanding, your best understanding of the scripture is that God is the one who determines that when he uses words like elected and chosen mm -hmm. and things like that, that mm -hmm. that is an action that he is doing. That's right. Foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For, foreknowledge does not mean that God looks down the tunnel of time and chooses you. It means God foreknown. What does that mean? Well, if you look at how the word know is used in the Bible, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bare a son. So knowledge, the word to know, is often a euphemism for sexual intimacy or love. And so when the scripture says in uh, Romans 9 that God foreknew, he is simply stating that God loved before the world began. He chose you. Um, and I, if you would like me to email you, I have a great, it's just two pages, uh, excerpt from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher, mm -hmm. who explains foreknowledge very well. It's written in that old English, but nevertheless... Uh, it's it's a good explanation of what it is yeah. to foreknow. It means to forelove. Right, that it, that God knows us in in the context of a saving relationship, That's not right. just facts about us, but That's knows right. us in the context of That's relationships. Right. So if we saw it in the negative, then we might better understand what Christ is saying when those come to him who say, didn't we do these things in your name? And he responds to them, I never knew you. So it's not that those people didn't know about Christ or know facts about Christ, but that Jesus knows who are his in terms of that saving relationship, that that's the deeper. It's more than just foreseeing. That's right. But it, right. it is knowledge right. in he, the context of relationship. He foresees everything anyway. Right. So he already knows right. anyway. Right. But like you said, Matthew 7, 25 mm -hmm. is about certainly that. Yeah. I never knew you. Right. You workers of iniquity. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Pastor Mike, for that. Are we, so, are we confusing you? Are we like... The next question that we have um, regards this idea of reprobation. 
And so the person who is asking this question, which, praise God, you just got through teaching in your men's systematic theology class. You've worked through these elements as aspects of our salvation, both election and reprobation, and now you're into regeneration, so you're just, you're just right in the middle of all of this. Um, so I'm sure you'll be able to give us a, a perfectly concise answer to this question, <laughs> which is how does reprobation fit with all of the many scriptures that state in one form or another, quote, all will be saved. And that's the quote of the person asking the question. The scriptures um, that she references don't actually say that all will be saved, but I yeah. think what she's saying, as I look here at Joel 2, 32, I read, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then she um, references John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Um, and so she's asking, how, how does reprobation fit? If God loves the whole world, yeah. then what am I supposed to do with this idea of reprobation, which is that God in sorrow and grief chooses to pass over some for salvation. Yeah, that's the word we use to pass over. So uh, a sovereign decision by God before the creation of the world, he's decided not to save some and to turn them over to their own sin to manifest his justice. His power, yeah, justice. So power. he's showing his justice and punishing those who are evil. And yet at the same time that he does that, he is also manifesting his love. Right. Our problem is, is we don't understand when it says God so loved the world. The word loved there, agapao, which we say agape because that's the form in which it appears in the New Testament. But in the root form, agapao, which does not occur in the New Testament, but that's where the word comes from. Love, if you look through the scriptures, is given to us and used five different ways. You've read the scriptures and you know that the Father loves the Son and the Son loves the Father. And they all dwell, the Father, the Son, in spirit and perfect unity in the Trinity. That's the first definition of love. That God, love, is love. The second definition of love, how it's used in the scripture, is God's providential care for his creation. He provides food to eat. He clothes, right, the beauty of the flowers. And he takes care of the beast of the field. The Bible tells us that he sustains his creation. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. So you say, does God love a lost person? Well, does he love them with inner Trinitarian love? No, they're not part of the Trinity. Does he love them in his providential care for them? Yes, because he loves all creatures, all right? So there's two different uses of the word love. The third usage is the word that you're thinking of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we call this the love of salvation or salvific love. Simply means this, that God stands here with his arms wide open saying, all you who are weary, come unto me and I will give you rest. I love the world. And by the way, the world does not mean in the context the bigness of the world. The world in its context means the badness of the world. In other words, he's saying even though you are a sinner, depraved, mm -hmm. right, in, unable to save yourself, my offer of the gospel is still free. Now that seems in our mind inconsistent. How could God offer the gospel freely to everybody and yet some reject? Well, the point is, is that God can never be held responsible for not saving everyone to show his love on some and his justice on others. In other words, when you go to hell, you get God's justice. If you go not to heaven, you specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. When you go to heaven, you get his mercy. The fact that he chooses some to demonstrate his mercy and others to demonstrate his justice is no injustice in God. He does what he does according to his pleasures. The fourth understanding of love is election. He chose you before the foundation 
of the world. The fifth understanding of his love is simply, you know this as a believer, if you do things as a believer that honor him and live a life filled with the Spirit of God, the Father demonstrates his love towards you. But when I'm disobedient and I do what is wrong, he chastises me just like a father does to his son. It doesn't mean that he doesn't love me any love less, but the Bible does say those whom he loves, right? He takes care of them and he disciplines them because he loves them. So those are the five uses of the word love. They're not different words. They're the same words, agape, and that spells love. The problem is, is it's used in different ways, just like we use the same word in different ways in the English language, so they did in the Greek language. Mm -hmm. And just by the way, the word phileo, which also means love, and the word agape, which also means love, are used interchangeably in the New Testament. So if you come to the word phileo, people often think, oh, that's human love. But it's used interchangeably, both of divine love and both of, of human love. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know, that help? They're going to hold deeper. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the questions that still remains out of that, um, out of that understanding, and thank you for giving us a broader understanding of that, um, is still kind of around this word all. So last week, I believe it was last week when we were um, studying chapter 10, Paul makes these really astounding statements that, that are hard to reconcile um, with the idea that some are chosen and some are passed over and that both of those are expressions of God's love. And because he makes these statements where he says things like everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yeah. And so when he says everyone, and I've got a couple of questions here that, that really I'll just read them both because I think they're both related to each other. Um, so our understanding was that everyone can be saved, but not everyone will be saved. Yeah. And so then this question is this, if everyone can be saved, what about those who were not chosen? So if it's true, if that's true that everyone can be saved, if everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved, then what, what about those who are not elect? And then how can it be explained, here's the second question that's similar, that our God who has the character and integrity that he has, who sent his son so that all can be saved, then chose because of his sovereignty one over another. And then the very um, honest confession um, of this, this uh, woman says this idea of election to me contradicts Romans 10.9, which is this idea that everyone who calls on the name Confess of the Lord Confess with your saved. mouth and believe in your heart. Right. Yeah. Right. So again, in one sense, I understand the question but the question is asked by the Apostle Paul, why did God mm -hmm. choose Jacob over Esau? Mm -hmm. And as he reasons through that passage of Scripture, you'll understand that that choice of God is bound up in his infinite wisdom. Mm -hmm. Not because Jacob was better than Esau, not because he saw Esau's faith in advance, or uh, Jacob's faith in advance, mm -hmm. excuse me, um, but simply out of his own divine pleasure. Mm -hmm. And he argues right back in Romans 9 to his authority that God makes a pot, one for honor, a vessel for honor, and one for dishonor. And that is where we're left. But I want you to understand, as the question, the question presupposes the idea that the reason why the person isn't saved is because they haven't been elected. That's right. The Bible doesn't say that. The That's Bible right. answers the question this way. The reason you're not saved is not because you haven't been chosen, but because you've rejected the gospel. Right. And that's what the Bible says. So, so there is a tension between God's sal salvation of election, where he chooses you, and human responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, J.I. Packer, in his little book on evangelism and the sovereignty of God, calls it an, an antinomy. Mm -hmm. An antinomy is where you have two logical lines or points of truth that for whatever reason, in our minds, they do not intersect. They're truth, this is true, this is true. God is sovereign. I'm responsible to receive him. Both of those are taught in scriptures. Both of those are true. Where do they intersect? I have no idea. God does, and he knows why he chose one over the other. 
He even says in the book of Deuteronomy, Israel, I've chosen you as a nation, not because you're more numerous, not because you're better than the other nations. I chose you because I loved you. I loved you, right? And, and so in one sense, uh, I don't know if this is a good analogy to use in a women's group, but um, you've, many of you are married and have, right, been through a marriage or whatever, however you want to say it. So I chose my wife, Sandra. Um, she wasn't the only woman on the face of the earth, but she was the woman that I set my affections on. And I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. That's not a condemnation of every other woman in the world. That's just my affections for her. And somehow God set his affections on you, and I don't understand why. But he did. He set his affections on me, and he chose me. I don't know why, but I, I, every day I get up and I say, thank you, Lord, for choosing me. Thank you for loving me. I can't explain why somebody else doesn't. The Bible tells me because they, that the stubbornness of their heart, they're unwilling, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're not willing to come. They're not willing to repent. They love their own sin. They're being held captive in one sense by the evil one, and he will not let them go. And it's bound up in the infinite wisdom and counsel of God. And if that's hard to understand, I agree with you. It's hard to understand. And I don't understand it all, but I just know what the scripture reveals to us, right? Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong unto God. Someday maybe we'll know. Someday we'll get to heaven and he may give us the reason why. Yeah, I mean, the other part of that, of that verse in Deuteronomy is that, but the things revealed belong to, to us and to our children. Yeah. And so there's great hope in that as well. And I think the, the passage you were quoting is really helpful. That's a, just a very helpful thing for you to say so clearly is that there is a presupposition in the question that the reason someone does not come to saving faith is because they're not elected, and that isn't what the Bible right. teaches. And I think that that's the heart and the grief of Jesus that you were just referencing right. in Matthew 23, where, where Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which is the people that he chose, right? He's, that's the, he's saying Jerusalem, not the city, but the, but the people. Um, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Mm -hmm. So the will of God um, was for them and their own will was against God. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Pastor Mike, that is, that is very helpful. We have just a couple more questions. Um, one, I think that probably came out of our study of chapter 9, where we were understanding and Paul was saying that those who are saved are not saved by their privilege, you know, where he says that he's talking about the Jews and to them belong the covenants, the, the worship, the, all of those things, the six things he lists there, um, that we're not saved by our privilege, we're not saved by our pedigree or our parentage, um, and we're not saved by our performance, where he says that the, the Jews were not seeking the salvation of God, the righteousness of God through faith, but through works. And so I'll, my question, this question I, I think is probably coming out of that, where um, the woman who asks it says, what does it mean when the Bible says, work out your salvation in fear and trembling? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good, and I, I'm not exactly sure what the question is other than just to simply say, that when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, mm -hmm. I'll read you this passage from Peter. Um, and, and there's many, many more passages that are like this. But again, you're dealing with attention here. You're dealing with the idea that now because I am saved, because the Lord does know me, because the Lord does love me, I respond by the fruit of the Spirit. And the life that I live, I live in faith. Mm -hmm. And so it is this way of simply saying, hey, you have to walk in obedience, the obedience of faith. You're not working for your salvation. You're working out your salvation. You are demonstrating that you have been saved. So here's the way Peter says it in chapter 1 of First Peter. Uh, it says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, uh, he's talking about being born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power is being guarded. So your faith is being guarded by God in heaven 
That's his power keeping you. And then the next verse is, let me just read all of verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. So when the Bible talks about saved, it talks about past tense, I have been saved, right? I've come to faith in Christ. I am being saved because I am working out or manifesting or demonstrating my salvation. And then like he says here, I will be saved and it's ready to be revealed at the last time. So I live my life as a person who's been saved. I am living my life as a person who not only has been saved, but is demonstrating my salvation through my obedience. However, I look at my body, I look at my imperfections, I look at my sinfulness, and I say to myself, man, I need to get saved. <laughs> saved from sin. I've been saved from the grips of sin and the power of sin, but now I need to be saved from the present reality of that sin, and it will not be till the day that I die and step in glory, I'll be free from the sin completely. So we live our life in, ret in, in light of the fact that we will be completely saved. However, we also live our life with that tension of that I am continuing demonstrating ongoing faith through obedience. So I ask people the question, who lives your Christian life? Is it you or is it God? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Here's what Paul says. Galatians 2.20. You know the verse of Scripture. Can any of you quote it? Anybody want to give it a try? I'll, I'll read it to make sure I get it right. How's that? Is it, okay, that's good. That's good. The first word is in my Bible here. I... Have, I have been crucified with Christ. So what does it mean to be crucified with Christ? To be dead. You were put to death. I live my life, he says here, I've been crucified with Christ. Then what does he say? It's no longer I who live. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now think about that for a moment. I'm crucified with Christ, I'm dead, it's no longer I live, but Christ who lives in me, right? And I live my life in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God. <laughs> so you have Paul clearly saying, I'm dead, yet I live, yet not I, Christ lives. So who lives your Christian life? Yes, me and God. <laughs> yes. So... That's a, that's a synergism we call that, we, that God works together with us as we work. But that working is not for my salvation. It's a working that expresses the manifestation of my salvation, which are the fruits of the Spirit. Thank you. Okay, we have just two more questions. And, so, and these questions are specific to Romans chapter 11. Okay. Um, and I think... I think there that the answers will be fairly straightforward. Um, like, and like yes or no? I think so. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that this one is a yes or no answer, but you can, we'll see if, okay. if you agree or not. Um, and then once we finish these two questions, we'll have just a few minutes remaining. And if anybody has any follow-up questions or anything you'd like to ask um, today, we'll welcome you to do that. So uh, here is the penultimate question for, that we have submitted written. What is meant by until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in in Romans 11:25, Meaning salvation offered to all Gentiles generation after generation and they become the grafted children of God. You don't have that on yours, paper, probably because that, that, just, that just came in. So I think what this person, you want to see it? Yeah. I think what they're trying to ask is does, 11, does Romans 11.25 mean that Gentiles will continue to be grafted in 
to the people of God until the fullness has come in? I, I, I believe that's what, what she's asking there, but maybe you see something else. Yeah, so obviously it's pretty clear in the New Testament that Paul argues that uh, he even calls himself the apostle of the Gentiles mm -hmm. because of the rejection and the stubbornness of the Jewish people who rejected Christ. Mm -hmm. And so right now is a time of the Gentiles, which means that God's mercy and grace has been opened up to those who are Gentiles, right. who were not part of the original tree or the root system. We owe our salvation to God's choice of Israel and God's elect privileges of the Jewish people. It was established for them. But God also says those branches were cut off for their disbelief, and we, as wild olive branches, have been grafted in. If you go around Paso Robles, you'll see vines, or you'll see uh, almond trees, or almond trees, however you want to say it, and there'll be a big knot at the bottom of the tree. And they do that because they take a healthy root stock that is good, and then they graft in a different variety to produce what they want to produce that produces good fruit and has a good root stock. And that's what God did with us. He grafted us in. So wild olive branches as we are have been grafted in to produce fruit. That's what the, that's what the text is saying. And then in addition to that, um, he's also saying to us that time will be for a while. We don't know how long that will be. The time of the Gentiles will come to an end. And depending upon your understanding of the doctrine of the last things, which we call eschatology, there will be a time where God works with his people again. And Paul says the words, and all Israel will be saved. I think he means there not every single Jew walking on the face of the earth, but again, all those who have been chosen by God. There'll be a great revival again in, in the Jewish religion where they recognize Jesus Christ as Messiah. Zechariah 12 says, when he descends and he splits the Mount of Olives, they will look at him and whom they have pierced. There'll be a reawakening of Israel. So a lot of people in their theology today look at Israel as a new nation started in 1948 in terms of its current location. And it's been through a lot of experiences over the past 50, actually 70 years. And they say, look, God is working with Israel again. But what you see is a political nation now. You see a political movement. You don't see a spiritual movement of the nation. Yes, there are born again, complete Jews, we call them like Dr. Frankel. Mm -hmm. But a wave has not gone through Israel where they have seen Christ. And that's what we're waiting for. You walk through Israel, they're still Jewish. They still do not believe in the Messiah. They still have rejected Christ. They're there politically. They are there because they want to be there. And they may be there because God is going to open up the door to use them again. But I always treat Jews with respect and honor and thank them because it is through them they diligently kept God's word in terms of writing it and securing it and getting it to us and now we who were the wild olive branches have been grafted in absolutely incredible so God is doing something in Israel right now it just hasn't happened as a spiritual revival if you remember if any of you are old enough to remember the 67 war when they were shuttling arms across the Hinnom Valley and they had recaptured Jerusalem and particularly the Wailing Wall, the hundreds of Jewish soldiers that ran to that wall and were weeping and crying and weeping and crying. The weeping and crying, though, is without Christ. And so I pray that, that someday, as Paul does, that their hearts would be given over to the true Messiah. And that's what my hope for Israel is. So now we have a remnant of Israel here on the earth, that is yeah. those who are believing and who have not sought righteousness apart from Christ, but have looked to Christ and understood that he is the fulfillment um, 
of the law. He is the end of the law. So we have this remnant, but we are waiting for this partial hardening to be removed. Mm -hmm. um, as Paul talks about here in Romans chapter 11, he's talking through this idea of grafting. And it reminds me in my front yard, we didn't know this until um, the roses began to bloom, but we have a a, one rose in particular in our front yard that's this beautiful white rose. Um, and every time it blooms, it puts out all kinds of white roses. And then once a season... They, they are beautiful. I, I go there and cut, cut them <laughs> to get my white flowers. Once a season, closer to the base of the rose, comes this gorgeous, giant red rose. And so as this rose was being cultivated... Clearly, they used one kind of stock, and they put a rose, there's still a rose, and out come these beautiful white roses. But we can see that the root, the stock, is this beautiful red rose. And because that's the stock of the rose, we certainly, if I knew what variety it was, I need to get Elisa to come over and look at it, could probably graft back in that same rose and have them both fully blooming and flourishing on this root stock. Um, and so it's a reminder to me sometimes that the, that, that red rose is this remnant of re reminding us what that stock is made out of. And it supports these white roses who would not live were it not for that particular root. And that's what Paul's saying to us, right? He's saying, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root it that supports, supports you. you. Yep. And so the final question that we have um, is uh, from someone who asks if this particular passage talking about breaking off and grafting in, is this, for those, for those people who believe that it's possible to lose your salvation, is this one of the texts that people look to um, to say, oh, see, you can, you can lose your salvation because it's possible to be broken off? So that's, the, that's the, the final question that we have here. Yeah, so two things. I, I believe in perseverance of the saints. Mm -hmm. That is that all those who are truly saved will persevere. Mm -hmm. I also believe in eternal security that once you belong to Christ, you're truly His. But however, a profession of faith does not mean that you always possess faith. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people, like in Matthew 7, who said, Lord, Lord, look at everything I've done for you. That's a terrifying passage of Scripture. And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Right. So... Uh, if you're truly His, you belong to Him. Uh, if you remember Sunday's message, as we talked about salvation, we talked about the inheritance that we will receive that is ours. And also Paul says, not only am I sealing you in the Spirit, which is a guarantee, but the inheritance that you're going to receive is yet to be revealed. Yeah. And then we go to Jesus' gospel, and He tells us so clearly that you're in my hand. And I'm not going to let go of you. And then my father's wrapped his hand around my hand, and you can't get out. John which, 10. John 10, yeah. John 10 mm -hmm. which means that you eternally belong to him. So the ones here that are spoken of in Romans 11 that were uh, a, a, a branch that was cut off are the unbelieving Israel. So Israel, in one sense, was elected as a nation and chosen as a nation, but not in the same sense of elected in terms of eternal salvation. So they're chosen by God to work with them as a nation, but obviously individuals did not believe, and so they were cut off. I mean, look at how far Judaism had gone from the faith of Abraham to all of the righteous Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and those who were there in the court yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Total rejection. And Peter even says it in the book of Acts. <laughs> Not only did God allow that to be ordained by you, but the blood of our Savior is on you <laughs> for the rejection of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So the fact that here not all the nation believes does not mean that they've lost salvation. Although there are those who are Christians, they are Christians, of a certain movement who believe you can lose your salvation, and they will give an altar call every Sunday, and people who will go down to that altar week after week after week to be saved. And 
the fact is, is they think they've lost it because of something that they've done. And so I've done this, so therefore I need to get resaved. Which ultimately is self-determination. Absolutely. Yeah. They're there. That's how they think about it. Mm-hmm. It's all up to me. Right. Rather than doing what the Bible says, when you sin and I sin, John tells us we do. Mm-hmm. But he also tells us what? To confess our sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's like Jesus saying to Peter, who didn't want him to wash, when, he, when, when, when Peter offers to, to wash, excuse John, me, when Jesus offers to wash Peter's feet. John 13. Yeah. yeah. And, and Peter says, no, you're not going to wash my feet. And he says, if I don't wash your feet, then you don't have any part with me. And he says, okay, fine, then wash my whole body. And he right. says, you don't need an entire, you yeah. don't need a whole bath here, he, Peter. He who is clean does not need to be rewashed. And yet. so in that way, we can understand yeah. uh, the nature of our, of our salvation, uh-huh. of confession and forgiveness, and that even working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, right. which would be more of an understanding of our sanctification and how that works yeah. um, in the process of our yeah. salvation. So thank you, Pastor Mike. Good. Do Those have- are all eight questions that we have written, and I, I promised the ladies that we'd spend about an hour, so we've got about 10 minutes. Um, if you have any, any questions, any follow-up questions, we'd love to take them now. I, I have a list here of who's elect and who's not. <laughs> so let's go down this list, and if your name's not on there, then... <laughs> <laughs> we need to pray. <laughs> so it looks like Mary Innocenti has a question, and Teresa will bring her uh, a microphone. Do you know that Mary taught me how to play? Uno. Far- Farkle. Farkle. Uh, is that is that the game? She also <laughs> she games. also introduced me to bingo because I'd never played bingo before. Mm-hmm. She's a fun she's a fun gal. Hi, Mary. We are fun. Mm-hmm. So my question was. On reprobation. Yes. Reprobation. And I'm still in the muddy water. Mm-hmm. Because on one hand, you say that we are all chosen, and yet it is those who do not accept that are not among the elect. Is that? Well, we're not all chosen. That's the clarification. Some are chosen. Some are not chosen. Those who are not chosen, God's passed over. So, you remember the illustration from the book of Exodus where children of Israel had gone through the ten plagues and then at the very end, the last one was going to be the angel of death that came through and they had to, you remember, slay a lamb and put blood on the doorpost and on the lintel and that angel would pass over and death would not enter that house. So those who are not covered by the blood of Jesus are going to be the ones who are reprobate. Not because God hasn't chosen them, but because they have rejected His message. They don't have the blood of Christ to cover their yeah. sin, and so they end up bearing the punishment They of end up that bearing sin. the punishment, which is nothing more than the justice of God. So if, let me ask you this. Mary, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Is He your Lord and your Savior? Absolutely. Do you love to do good things for him? Yes. My sister, <laughs> you're elect. Okay? You bear the fruit of what it is to know our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. And rejoice in that. Election as a doctrine is meant for you to be encouraged and comforted by that. Mm-hmm. That's why Paul, can you imagine living in the disparity of not knowing whether I'm truly saved or not? How, how horrible that would be to get up every morning and be uncertain. He doesn't want that uncertainty in your life. He wants you to know that His love is with you. And as you place your faith and trust in Him, and you may not even know the date or the time or the moment. Some of you grew up in Christian homes where you were taught the gospel, and at some point and at some time, you yielded your heart to Jesus. And you may not remember that time you were so little but you've continued to follow him in faith. You're saved. I remember the time that I got saved because mine was what they call a crisis conversion. The, the, the preacher was preaching the gospel on Sunday night. I was in the pew, <laughs> sitting there as a little boy, singing the invitation song, closed the hymnal, 
put it down. I remember doing that. Next thing you know, I was standing up there by the pastor. Dr. Proppy said, Michael, do you, what, what are you up here for? And I said, I, I need to be saved. Well, he had chosen me before the foundation of the world, but I still need to respond in faith and trust, and that's what I did. And so from my point of view, I look at it and I go, I received Christ. I made that decision. And yet when I read my Bible, it says, no, Mike, I loved you a long time ago. And remember I said, God jiggles our willer. <laughs> he came along and jiggled your willer, and you responded. Yeah. Does and that then, answer? Yeah. Okay. okay, go ahead. Does that answer your question, Mary? It does? Okay. Okay. We'll talk about it over bingo. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Gwen. You were the Hi. awesome mom of this young lady right here. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know her, it's Shalini's mom. And Patrick, who comes, or her husband, he's our greeter during our second hour, and you can't get out of here without him grabbing you and hugging you. So, so I think what's harder for some of, us, some of us, me in particular, is that I have a child who's chosen obviously yes but i have a child who may not be right and so then i have to ask god why yeah why would you not choose this one yeah and right. i think that that is more difficult mm. because i know that he chose me so right you know and i don't know that there's an answer to that well I mean, to say that god passes over you know i want to think that that he loves my son as much as i do right so he wouldn't pass over him. Right. Yeah, so this is the problem with the doctrine of election because it seems to play on our affections mm -hmm. and our will and our determination as an individual. So there is a lot of truths in Scripture that we cannot reconcile. Why is it that this one we have the hardest time with? And that is because it interrupts the thinking that I have, that I make my own choices and decisions. And the truth is, is yes, you do. And the truth is, is that if you have a child who is right now not a believer, it isn't probably because they haven't heard the gospel or seen that gospel lived through your life. That has been a testimony over and over and over again to the grace of God. I would think that that child knows enough right now that if that child wanted to come to Christ, that child could. And not only could that child come to know Christ, it may not happen to years after you've departed from the face of the earth. So we never know when, and we never know who, and we never know why. But that does not mean that you're not a good mom because you've lived the gospel. Have you made mistakes? Sure, we all have. But at the same time, the responsibility doesn't lay on you. It lays on them because that's how the Bible presents it. So when God tells us, when Paul tells us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, he isn't saying being transformed by the renewing of your emotions. He's saying by be transformed by what my word says is truth. So the truth of his word is you don't know if he's elect or not, but you are going to live every day for Christ. You're going to pray every day for that child's salvation, and you're never going to give up, and you're going to love them. Why? Because God loves them. And remember the different five different types of love. And whether that fourth one is going to happen, where they've already been elected, we don't know. But we're never going to give up. And, and for those of you who have unsaved children, don't think of yourself as a bad parent, because you can do that. You can put that on yourself. I've seen some terrible parents terrible parenting. And I said kids who, who, who had no business, <laughs> this is a weird way to say it, they had no business getting saved and they got saved. <laughs> and you look at that and you go, what? <laughs> so yeah, you, you, that's a tension to live with, isn't it? But understand this, God loves all prodigals. He does. I'm going to teach tomorrow at Band of Brothers on the prodigal who was a Samaritan who was a woman, who was immoral, that he went right through Samaria, not all the way around, and went right to her, sat on a well, and talked to that person that society around there said, you should never talk to a woman, you definitely don't talk to a half-breed Samaritan. 
And you definitely don't talk to somebody who's immoral. And Jesus said, no. I loved her. I chose her. She's mine. I'm going to go get her. And the disciples came back and they were like, what are you doing? Doing the will of my father. Why? John 4, 23. The father seeks those who would worship him. That's what the father wants. He wants us to turn us from selfish people to people who worship him. And I think sometimes, and this is a hard, this is difficult, but maybe honest. Not that that was dishonest, that all of that was true. And <laughs> just I think, a lie. Yeah, I was making it all up. <laughs> yeah. I just but, wanted you to feel good, Gwen. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that at the heart of our will and our desire is to see the people who we love be saved, mm-hmm. even over and above the glory of God and the purpose of his will. And that Jesus Christ, even when he walked this earth, that, that he came here to do the will of his Father, and that was always preeminent in his mind because his desire was that God would be glorified. And I think a lot of times in our hearts, we put ourselves at the center of our own salvation, our own happiness, our own even glory, if we could say it that way, our own desire and our own will, rather than treasuring that Christ be vindicated in every way so that we would we would rejoice with those who he saves by his blood through his mercy and we would agree with his justice um, to punish sin that is does that refuses and rebels to come under that covering and that both of those things bring him glory and so we would say amen with those because I think there's even a, a heart sometimes honestly where um, especially the heart of a mom that is so um, turned toward her children that it's almost like we could say, I don't know, I mean, maybe this is just me, but Lord, just save my kids and then just go ahead and come because I don't really care about the rest of these people, right? So as long as my kids are saved, that's all, that's yeah. all I really need, and then you just go ahead and come and, uh, and, and get us out of here because well, that's, you, you know. You feel like Paul does in Romans 10 where he right. says, my heart's desire would be that Israel right. would come to know him. And then he even makes the shocking statement, would I be accursed or cast off from Christ Mm -hmm. that they might know him? You see his love, right? right? You see the tenderness of Jesus weeping over Israel. You see God loves lost people. And and how do you reconcile that with election and whatever you want to call it, human responsibility? I can't reconcile it. I just know that it's there. Right. But, But... what I can do mm-hmm. is I can pray. Yeah. And, and you know you pray. I know, Gwen, you pray. We all pray for our kids, don't we, and our grandkids. Pray for them all the time, all the time. Because God listens to prayer. Right. He truly does. And, and ask that the glory of God would be our preeminent desire. That it would eclipse all other things. And that's a hard thing because sometimes that results in suffering. Mm. And sometimes it's that very suffering that brings about the repentance that leads to faith. Yeah. And so that, that, those, are, those, are difficult, those are difficult things um, to, to process. I mean, that's my, that's my brother. Okay. So, you know, that's that we, we wrestle through these things. And it's, it's 1 o'clock now. So thank you all very much for, um, for coming and for joining us today. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank you. Um, we are going to release this episode on Thursday with the one that we, uh, Pastor Mike and I will record um, up over Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. So there will be two podcasts on Thursday um, for you to enjoy. But thank you so much to those of you who were able to join us today in person. And thank you, Pastor Mike, for investing you. um, your time and your heart Um, your compassion and pastoral care, um, your understanding and wisdom, and helping us grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Thank you. Well, thank you, girls, for having me. I appreciate it. Lord, we thank you for the time that you've given us to share together today. We recognize that even that time is yours, that this time is, is not ours, even these breaths that we take. 
have been given by you as a gift. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us submit to your righteousness and to treasure as our all-surpassing joy, the glory of God, Mm. that that would be, Father, the center of our heart's desire in Mm. the way that Christ spoke, in the way that he showed us that everything he did and everything he was working toward was because his desire was to see Mm. your glory. And as he did so, That glory, Lord, we just thank you that we, we saw it in him, that he is the full manifestation of the Godhead. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Son. And we thank you, Lord, that, um, that the invitation to belong to you, to be in Christ means that we are brought into that glory, into that family, that we then have the opportunity to be like oaks of righteousness planted for the display of your splendor. Father, there are things that we have understood and we understand more deeply now and and things that we don't. And frankly, Lord, things that we need to confess and things that we need to entrust. And we thank you that you are both willing and able to help us with all of those things. That your love for us was secured before the foundation of the world in the Lamb who is slain. Thank you, Lord, that we Mm. need look no further than the cross to know and understand your love for us even even when these things perplex us. Mm And because of that sacrifice, Lord, we do come and plead for mercy for all of those whom you have given us to love. And thank you, Lord, that if we love them, your love for them is incomparably greater. Mm -hmm. And we know it because we could not possibly love them in the way that you do, Lord, unless that was given to us by you. And so we feel then confidence, Father, to come and to ask you for mercy. For each one, I ask you for each one, each name that is on the mind and the heart of each woman gathered here and each one who will be listening. That you would have mercy and compassion that leads to salvation, that your table might be full. And that we might celebrate around that table together as the full family of God to the glory of Mm. Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Give us peace and settle our hearts and minds now as we walk away from here. Continue to teach us according to your word. Lord, thank you that you do not require us to have all depth of wisdom and insight in order to be loved and saved by you, Father, but that you, by your own spirit, will continue to teach us as we walk alongside you and as you keep us in your kindness, until the day we see Christ face to face. To that day we look, Lord, for that day we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.